The heart of my home is the kitchen. And at this time of the year, it's the perfect place to gather and celebrate the festive season. <laughs> For me, Christmas is all about rustling up some fantastic food and eating it in the company of my favourite people. These are the dishes that I cook when I want to spread a little bit of cheer. These are my Christmas home comforts. Many of us have our own Christmas rituals and habits. How and when to decorate the tree, or even our choice of snacks for Santa, it's all about tradition. And that includes those classic seasonal dishes that we love to eat every year. I'm going to share with you some of my favourite Christmas recipes that are guaranteed to satisfy your festive family food cravings. On today's menu, my cured seasonal salmon. Looks like Christmas already, look at that. Over in Austria, they have their own traditions, and Annie Gray dives straight in. Wow, quite an exciting way to get your Christmas dinner. While back here, food legend Michel Roux drops in. No pressure, then. It's only Christmas once a year, so don't panic, OK? I'm not panicking. <laughs> just, just happen to have a three-star Michelin <laughs> chef in my kitchen. There are some classics that should always be cooked in the same time-honoured way but there's also a few that you can make your very own by adding just a simple twist or two. Now, if you're talking about classic dishes around Christmas time, this has to be on the list. It's a glazed gammon, a fantastic piece of ham with a lovely glaze on the top. Now, so often people just use a mixture of just honey and cloves. I'm going to incorporate other flavourings into this, like marmalade, and I think it works an absolute treat, and serve it classically with a parsley sauce. My gammon joint has been soaked in cold water overnight to remove any excess salt. So pop the ham straight into the pan and then you can concentrate on the aromats. Some lemon, an orange, cinnamon stick, an apple, a little bit of onion, of course, and then to spice this up, just a touch of dry chilli. And then one thing that I absolutely love, star anise. This sort of aniseedy sort of flavour, I think, works so well with the gammon. So I'm going to put a few bits of star anise in it. Cover the ham with cold water, put it on to boil, and let it gently simmer for two hours. So the ham's ready. Now we need to pay attention to the glaze. And the glaze is really simple. It contains plenty of orange marmalade. This is what I used to have as a kid. Really good quality orange marmalade. So often it would be just done with honey, which is fine, but you'll find it can burn as well. I'm just going to peek on this up, spice it up a little bit with a bit of English mustard. And then pop in a few bits of star anise, only a couple. Now, what I like to do, first of all, is just basically bring this gently to the boil. While you wait, you can prepare the cooled ham. Snip off the string that held it all together and then decorate it with cloves. Once the glaze has come to the boil, pour away. As soon as this goes in the oven, you've got to keep your eye on it because the amount of sugar in the honey and the marmalade it can burn quite quickly. So set the oven quite high, 425, something like that. And then every sort of three or four minutes, take it out and just keep basting it. And as it cooks like that, it'll start to caramelise. It will only need about 20 minutes in the oven. Just enough time to prepare two things I love to serve with it. New potatoes and a classic parsley sauce. I say classic parsley sauce because you always start it off the same way as you do a classic bechamel sauce, which is milk and an onion clouté. It's one of the things that I learned at college. It's basically an onion, bay leaf, studded with cloves. And this is just to flavour the milk. Add the clouté to the pan and bring the milk to the boil. 
Take it off the heat immediately and allow the flavours to infuse. Next, melt some butter in another pan, add flour and whisk. Then pour in the milk, minus the onion, of course. We're just going to let that simmer and then we can pay attention to our ham. Keep basting the joint with your glaze until the sugars start to caramelise. Mine isn't quite ready yet, so in the meantime, I'm going to enrich the parsley sauce. I'm adding a touch of lemon juice, some double cream, a handful of chopped parsley, and a final seasoning of salt and pepper. Perfect. Then go back to the oven and check your ham again. How good does that look? And it'll look even better on the plate with these. Boiled new potatoes, tossed in butter and a little more chopped parsley. Now you can have this hot straight out of the oven, like I've done here, or cold as cold cuts, which makes it one of the best dishes, I think, for this festive period, because it's everything you want. Oh, sweet, it's tangy, particularly with that marmalade. It's not too sweet. It's just delicious. It's one of my favourites. OK, this might be the time of year for sharing, but with a succulent ham glazed in mustard and marmalade and a rich pasty sauce, I might just get a bit selfish. Could eat all that. Putting your own unique spin on a dish like this will delight your guests and get them in the mood to celebrate. But there are some Christmas classics that should never be messed about with. Joe and Richie Evans have taken one very old family recipe and used it to launch a successful seasonal business. When the rest of us are still enjoying our holes, they're heading to the kitchen to start preparing a dish that millions enjoy every December the 25th. The women in my family have been making Christmas pudding for generations and it's a nice tradition to carry on. Um, that's why I enjoyed making Christmas pudding so much in the beginning just for us. So when I was giving Christmas puddings to our friends and family, I would hear time and again that they were so much better than the supermarket version. They were like the puddings they'd had as a child or that their grandmother had made. Finding a good pudding recipe can be a problem, but Joy and Richie must have solved it because they sell thousands of theirs every year. So pay attention. It's a very traditional Christmas pudding recipe. We've messed around with it a little bit when we were making it for ourselves. We tinkered, but it's still very traditional. To start, Joe pours syrup into a bowl of dried vine fruits, glacé cherries, candied peel and sugar. She then adds veg suet, grates some apple and carrot and then stirs. If you fancy making this at home, remember you can always throw in some little extras. A very common tradition is to put trinkets into your Christmas pudding. So a coin would bring you fortune, um, a, a thimble would mean you'd be a spinster for the year, a ring would mean you'd be married within the year. Joe and Richie have found a dream marriage, mixing a successful business with raising a family. As she makes the puddings, he can concentrate on the kids. And these are the shells that we found on the beach today. The work that we're doing at the moment um, enables us to spend more time with the children and the beauty of the business is we can homeschool them now, we can spend as much time as we need to really. Time does get a little bit tight towards Christmas but it's still manageable at the moment so we're very happy with it. And the production of puddings can continue during lessons. Joe adds orange and lemon juice to the mixture, along with dried spices, flour, eggs and breadcrumbs. Then it's time for a drop of cider brandy and a splash of local stout before the whole family stir and make a wish. Done? Yeah. OK, Katie's turn then. Fine, Kate. Should we move the bowl towards you a bit? And make a wish. Now you've got to make a wish, but you've got to keep it secret. Do you two want to fill the your little ones? Here you are, Jack. Okay. Here you are, you can put that into the bowl. Jo covers her puddings in foil, then ties them with string, ready to be steamed. Four hours for the small puddings, 
and eight for the large. Plenty of time to head back down to the beach. When starting their business, the couple wanted to ensure they'd have plenty of time together. They were also determined to enjoy every aspect, including the selection of ingredients, two in particular. We spent an awful lot of time taste testing ales and brandies, which was, which was torturous, really. It only took us about a month to arrive at the, the two that we've eventually settled on, but it was a very busy month for us. And having sampled quite a bit of the hard stuff, Joe and Richie have formed a great bond with their local brewery staff. So much so, they're letting them sample the first puds of the season. It's absolutely delicious, and I don't think any Christmas meal would be right without lovely Christmas pudding at the end of it, just to finish it off perfectly. It's really luxurious. It's um, really Moorish, and you know you really feel like you're being spoiled. The nice thing about this Christmas pudding is that it just tastes really homemade. It just reminds me of childhood Christmases. It's taken hard work, though. Joe and Richie have been flat out producing and delivering their puddings from August right up to Christmas Eve. So has it all been worth it? It's lovely to be involved with such a fun time of year and uh, to be part of so many people's Christmases. It's fantastic to see everybody enjoying homemade Christmas, but you've done all the, all the efforts that we've put in over the year and yeah, our reward at the end is fantastic. OK, confession time. I'm not a big fan of Christmas pudding myself, however good the recipe. Mm, mm, mm. After a huge dinner, I prefer something a little lighter, but just as flavoursome. And I can't think of anything better than this one. This dish is fabulous, and it's based on a pavlova, but we're going to incorporate a few little winter sort of spices into it as well to make it a little bit more festive. So the first thing we need to do is make our meringue. First, whisk six egg whites until they form soft peaks. And with the machine still running, gradually pour in 300 grams of caster sugar. Add about a tablespoon of white wine vinegar and some corn flour, about a tablespoon. And then give it a quick mix. The vinegar and corn flour will give the meringue that soft, chewy centre everyone loves. And then what we need to do is pipe it out. That requires a little bit of practice. What we're looking for is a Christmas tree, not a twig. Fill the piping bag, make a small incision in the bottom and unleash your inner Picasso. The best advice I can give, really, is start off with a triangle and then gradually increase the size of the triangle and fill it in. And then basically just repeat the process, but you're just doing it slightly wider. Once you've created the outline of your tree with three triangles, pipe the trunk. And then smooth the meringue with a palette knife. Next, pipe a raised edge to hold the fruit filling in place. And finally, add any little flourishes that take your fancy. And there you have it. Not bad. Now I'm going to bake my meringue on a really low heat for one and a half to two hours. Now while that's in the oven, we can create the topping for our Christmas tree pavlova. And carrying on with the Christmas theme, first of all, you need to make a stock syrup. So we get a little bit of water in here and roughly equal quantities of sugar and water. So what you need to do now is boil this up with your Christmas spices, things like cinnamon, powdered ginger and a little bit of powdered clove. You have to boil the sugar, water and spices for roughly five minutes to let the syrup thicken. I love this dish. What you end up with is your whole kitchen smelling of sort of mulled wine. It's got that great combination of spices. Because of that, I'm going to add some orange and lemon zest. Rather than the zest, just take the whole lot and peel it. Now for the main fruit, in this case, fresh blackberries, and lots of them. Now, as soon as the berries are mixed together, we switch the heat off. We're not creating a jam, we're just creating a glaze 
for our blackberries. And you can see that the orange zest nicely caramelizes as well. Smells delicious. And if we leave that now for about the same amount of time as our meringue takes to cook, it'll be absolutely perfect. When both the meringue and fruit have cooled, whip some double cream along with some vanilla bean paste. And for the blackcurrant hit, one or three glugs of creme de cassis. I love this stuff, especially with champagne. It's just delicious. Mmm. Now we just have to assemble our tree. They always have this opinion in food, less is more, but particularly around this time of the year, it's all about indulgence, I think. And don't try to measure the quantity of topping either. You want a really thick layer of sweet and glossy blackberries. <laughs> all for me. The flavour of the blackberries is fantastic. Any fruit that's in season as well is perfect for this. And by spicing them up with that little bit of cinnamon, only a small amount of clove, you get this wonderful sort of mould fruit flavour. It's a dessert that people won't expect at this time of the year. But it's one that people will absolutely love. With its chewy meringue, luxurious cream and spice berry topping, this is one dish that'll definitely light up the season. Most Brits can't imagine Christmas without a tree, and they wouldn't settle for anything less than a classic roast turkey on the big day either. The Austrians also love their seasonal traditions, but many of them enjoy a very different meal during the holidays. As our festive food reporter, Annie Gray, has been finding out. The market stores here in Innsbruck are jammed with seasonal goodies, but to get a real taste of the classic Austrian Christmas, I headed far beyond the fairy lights of the city. My destination, a remote southern corner of the country. My mission, to track down a man who's got the perfect recipe for a traditional Christmas nosh-up. Twelve years ago, Peter Pafrat was a successful businessman in Vienna, but he gave it all up for a simpler life in the country with his wife and three children. He now farms a staple ingredient of a classic Austrian festive dinner, carp. I offered to help him catch some. Hello, Peter. Hello, Annie. Well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Put your waders on. OK. We go fishing. This isn't quite what I expected. I kind of thought fishing rod, maybe a picnic, kind of bucolic. Not waders and a pond. Better get them on. OK. I've got all the gear, but I'm still none the wiser. Thankfully, Peter knows what to do. He breeds carp in several ponds like this one. Fishing them out with nets is no easy task, so drastic measures are called for. We're draining the lake so we can get the carp out more easily. A bit like draining a bath. You pull the plug, the water comes out, and all the carp are pushed towards the plug hole. And then we're fishing them out with the nets. This is the classic way to catch your Christmas dinner. All the people you see helping come along for the day for free to help out in return for their Christmas carp. Now, I've never passed up an offer of free food before, and a muddy okay. pond's not going to put me off. Quite an exciting way to get your Christmas dinner. <laughs> not quite. Even though they've been cornered and put into a big net, it's still really tricky to catch one. They're slippery little devils. It's hard work. Yes. But I'm not going to let a fish beat me. OK. One. One. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this one's all mine. Wow. Quite a workout. <laughs> and you've been doing it well. You, people have been doing it like this 500 years. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> respect. 
We don't really think of carp as a Christmas dish in the UK, but this in Austria is an absolute Christmas classic. So what I'm doing now really is about as Christmassy as you can get. The carp will now be kept in small holding ponds until they are sold. But I want to understand exactly how carp fits into the festivities over here, so I've booked a cookery lesson with Peter. Peter, tell me what we're making here. Oh, we make a, a traditional um, Christmas dish. Potato salad with carp. Nearly the same uh, as fish and chips. I quite like the idea of having fish and chips for Christmas. When do you eat it in Austria? December 24. OK, so Christmas Eve. Back in the days when Austria was strictly Catholic, eating meat on the 24th of December was forbidden. So people turned to fish instead, and a Yuletide classic was born. We have here now the Karpfenfilet. Before we fry our Christmas Eve fish, it's coated in flour, egg and breadcrumbs. The fillets only take a few minutes to fry in hot sunflower oil. Now that's easier than preparing a roast on Christmas morning. Everyone loves fried fish. Yes. <laughs> These are like the best fish fingers ever. So, do we get to taste it? Yes. Excellent. And for the finishing touch, a potato salad dressed with apple vinegar, cooked onion, sugar, salt and vegetable stock. Quick, easy and not a Brussels sprout in sight. No wonder the kids love it. She makes this good? Yeah. Yeah? Cool. <laughs> this is a complete revelation. It's absolutely delicious and I can totally see why so many Austrians choose it for their Christmas meal. And the best thing about today is that I have helped to fish for a lot of Austrians' classic Christmas dinner. There's no reason why we in the UK shouldn't enjoy fish at this time of year too. But as carp can be hard to get hold of, I've got a luxurious recipe that will keep fish firmly on the menu. Now there's one dish that I would call a Christmas classic and that's smoked salmon. Now it's quite difficult to make your own smoked salmon and if you get a really good quality bought in one I would stick with it. But another cured salmon dish that you can do and would certainly be in my top ten around Christmas time is gravelax. It's really simple to make. First, top and tail the skinned and boned fillet of salmon so the fish is the same thickness throughout. You can always use the offcuts for other dishes like fish cakes. Now, the cure for Gravelax can vary so much, but fundamentally, it uses two ingredients, sugar and salt. And then we can make the additions of other ingredients, like some coriander seeds and some pink peppercorns. Roughly crush both of these in a pestle and mortar to help release their flavours. They can go into the salt and sugar mixture together with some dill. Now this is the crucial thing, really, whenever you're doing Gravelax. Next, place a layer of the cure mix on the bottom of the dish. Looks like Christmas already, look at that. Then place the fish on top and coat with the remainder of the cure. This now has to go in the fridge for 24 hours. I've got one in the fridge here. And you can see how much liquid comes out of this. This is just the moisture from the fish as the fish starts to shrink up. Let's face it, if I put you in a combination of salt and sugar, left you for 24 hours, you'd shrink a little bit. It's exactly the same thing with this piece of fish. Now the cure's done its job, you can simply wash it off. And once you've dried the fish with some kitchen paper, it's ready for a hot and herby topping. And this is where we can grab some of our Dijon mustard and just spread this over the surface of the fish. Now this is purely optional. I've had this in a variety of different ways, but this is just my personal taste, really. I wouldn't use English mustard, it's too strong for this. Dijon mustard is actually perfect. Now chop a large handful of dill and sprinkle it over the top of the salmon. 
patting it down onto the Dijon. I'm actually going to serve this with an amazing mustard. It is really simple to make your own mustard at home. And here's how. Add some crushed juniper berries to a pan with some mustard seeds, dark brown sugar, a drop of red wine vinegar, and a pinch of salt. Bring the mix to the boil and let it gently simmer for six to eight minutes before adding something a little special. And then I'm going to add just a touch of champagne. Well, it is Christmas, isn't it, really? Take the mix off the heat and then blitz in a food processor for three to four minutes. I'm sure you'll find something to do while you wait. When you get about halfway through, you can just check it, make sure the consistency is getting there, and then offset it with a little bit of champagne on a top up. Blitz it again. I think I might be blitzed by the end of this. But there you have it. You know, your instant homemade grain mustard. Great accompaniment with salmon. I'll stick it in a jar with a ribbon on it. Instant Christmas present. With the luxury mustard made, all I have to do is slice and plate up the gravel axe. Don't use a serrated knife for this. It's got to be a flat bladed knife, nice and sharp. Otherwise, you're just going to rip the fish. Carefully cut the gravel axe into thin, even slices. If you present it properly, you'll really wow your guests. And you can see how much you get out of just one side of salmon. And of course, you've got this amazing champagne mustard. And for me, it needs very little else, really. Maybe just some pumpernickel bread, something like that. It tastes so much better if you make it yourself. The champagne's not a bad touch, too. This would be in my top ten favourite things to eat at Christmas. It's a real classic. Gravel axe on its own is fantastic, but with a very quick and simple champagne mustard, it makes it extra special. Cheers. Cured, coated and accompanied with festive fizz, this salmon will definitely keep the Christmas spirit alive. One more? Oh, go on then. But for most of us, December 25th is all about the bird. Food historian Ivan Day has been finding out why poultry and game play such a big part in our annual feast. There's an age-old debate as to whether turkey or goose is the most traditional bird for Christmas. But I would argue that all birds were once traditional Christmas fare. Because after an autumn of stuffing themselves with berries and nuts, they've put on so much weight that they're absolutely perfect for the Christmas dinner table. And in our culinary past, no bird was off limits. Swans, pheasants and partridges were particularly popular for those wanting to put on a bit of a show. And Ivan never shies away from a culinary challenge. I'm going to make a beautifully opulent cold partridge pie. And I'm going to adorn the crust of the pie with the bird's own wings, tail and head. There you go, he never lets us down. When the 12 Days of Christmas song was written in 1780, five of those days featured birds, including, of course, a partridge in a pear tree. And cookery books of the period embraced the theme too. My recipe is from a book that was published in London in 1809 by a cook called Frederick Nutt. It's called The Imperial and Royal Cook and contains recipes that were exclusively aimed at the very wealthy. This is a real show-off pie, the sort that could have been served to George III. And the ingredients are certainly fit for a king. It includes six partridges, deboned and then stuffed. Ivan's using force meat, a highly seasoned chopped pate, along with truffles, quite a few of them, in fact. Time to take out a second mortgage. 
I'm going to make what I think is probably the most expensive scotch egg in the history of the culinary arts. So I'm going to take some of my veal force meat and pop into it one of these wonderful perfumed truffles and then very gently shove it into the little bird. Partridge and truffle actually do go together, but they're also a style statement like Lamborghini and Prada, really. I mean, it's that kind of a combination. The poor, they would enjoy partridge every now and then, but they'd have to poach it, and it was at the risk of their lives, because they could often get hung or sent to the colonies for, you know, stealing the Lord's partridges. Thankfully, Ivan's partridges are 100% legit. Now it's time to line the pie mould with a traditional pastry made with flour, butter and egg yolks. Ivan lines the base with some veal slices and then a thick layer of the force meat. And now the partridges go in, along with some more raw truffle and even more veal force meat. And the whole lot is topped off with streaky bacon rashes. And the astonishing thing in Frederick Nutt's recipe is that he tells you that you should keep this pie for three months before you actually open it. Like a lot of these early pastry meat and fish preparations, it was actually a method of preserving the meat for a long time. If you say so, Ivan. The pie is covered with a pastry lid and a hole is made in the center for a rich jelly that was often added later. It then goes in the oven to cook for four hours. No partridge pie would be complete without the piece de resistance of a lovely embellishment of partridge plumage on top. Putting the bird on top of the pie, whether it was a swan or a partridge, actually told you at these great festive tables what was in that pie. And one final Midas touch, gold leaf. I'm pretty happy with that because it looks just like ones I've seen in 17th century paintings. Well, it certainly looks the part on the outside, but how has that exclusive filling turned out? Now that is what I call a pie. Mm. That was a lot of hard work, but it was really worth it because it is absolutely delicious, it's superb. There we have it, a pretty classy Christmas classic. Not a turkey dinner, but a partridge in a pear pie. Yeah, like me, I think Ivan should stick to the cooking. We may have moved on a few centuries, but I still put a game bird on my Christmas table every year. I always enjoy welcoming friends too, and no more so than one of my all-time Michelin-starred heroes, Michel Roux. <laughs> How are you doing, boss? You all right? I'm really neat. Good Lovely to see you. Here. Come on in, love to see you. If anyone can give me a masterclass on cooking this wonderful seasonal dish, it's him. Well, welcome back to the kitchen. I love that store. I, I like the, I like the shirt and the apron. <laughs> That's my Christmas, my Christmas apron. <laughs> I can I, you can put some splotch on it. Nobody will see it. You see. Is this this know. is definitely your Christmas apron, is it? It is. I'm wearing it every year. And the shirt is a 1960 shirt. Yeah. It's like a man. Yeah. Are you happy? You're all dressed? I am feel good. <laughs> you feel good? Yes. You've got your Bloody Mary? Yes. Well, right. Yeah. Now, yeah. I thought we'd do a pheasant. Yes. Because I love pheasant, but you, you have a passion for pheasant this time of year, though, don't you? Well, for me, Christmas is always pheasant. Right? Because pheasant is small. Yeah. And we never more than eight or ten at Christmas. Right. Because we're a small family, a lot of us are working. Yeah. And I believe a pheasant there is no cold milk yeah. left. Turkey, I love turkey too. You yeah. got to have a big party and you got to face the cold turkey for quite a few days. Yeah. Yeah. So let's have a pheasant. So exactly. So we've lovely. got some lovely, lovely pheasant here, and I thought what we'll do is we'll roast that off mm. with a nice little, nice little ravioli. So, so how would you cook your your pheasant? Would you roast it whole on Christmas uh, Day or what? I roast it whole and I let it rest on the breast. 
Yeah. Uh, our, but you, what are you doing there? You're doing a canoe. You're taking it off. Yeah, I'm taking <coughs> I'm taking the, the yeah. legs off because that's I thought funny. I would do a nice little fast for that's, your. Uh, that's one of the best way. For your, I'm glad I'm doing it right. Yeah. I'm not feeling any pressure here, honest. I mean, mm. it's only Michelle Rue. Right, let's separate the legs into drumsticks and thighs and remove the breast crown from the carcass. You could get your butcher to do this for you. But I never get to ask you this, really. You, you yes. come around to the house and I never get to sort of chat to you about, you know, what was life like for you when you were younger? Well, you Learn from your mum or what? Christmas, I was a pastry chef, apprentice, in a shop in Paris. Yeah. And therefore, I was working seven days a week around Christmas and New Year. Yeah. In fact, I was sleeping on the table near the stove during the night. On the, and my pillow was a bag of sawdust. I'm serious. Right. So I never had a Christmas for, until the age of about 22, 24. All my life for Christmas was making people happy, but making what about, cakes. What about before that, then, when you, when you, were, uh, when you were a young before, kid? What was... Before that, you know, there was not very much money at home. Right. So Mum was uh, doing a Christmas with whatever we had. Yeah. And the Christmas was not the best Christmas, I've got to say. It was not sad. Yeah. Because we had food on the table, but it was a very humble food. Like, for example, a stew. Yeah. But there was more vegetable in a stew than meat. There's certainly no shortage of meat today, though. And I'm adding the drumsticks to a hot pan. As they cook, place the chopped skin thigh meat for the ravioli in a food processor, along with some cream, salt and pepper, and blitz to a fine puree. Grate in a teaspoon of truffle and blitz until smooth. Next, add some chopped carrot, leek and celery to the drumsticks and fry until they're golden. Who does cooking on Christmas Day, then? Because my well, family's one of the greatest... Uh, I will be. <laughs> ..culinary dinners in the world. Who, I will does, be. who does the cooking, then? Well, if we've got the fish, it's Robin. Robin, my wife. Yeah. And she cooks fish beautifully well. And she loves fish. Yeah. Because it's cooked very quickly. And I will cook the pheasant. Right. Yes, because I like my pheasant perfectly cooked. So I'm waiting to see what you're going to do with yours. <laughs> <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Let's make sure that you're not yeah. messing it up. Now place the frying pan in the oven for 15 to 18 minutes. While the pheasant crown cooks, lay out a few ready rolled fresh pasta sheets and cut out some large discs. So I remember working, <laughs> working in London and not really seeing your family at Christmas time, because it's an incredibly busy time, isn't it, really? Sometimes I never used to go back home to see my mother. Yeah. For two or three nights, because I was working through the night, well, sleeping on for a few hours on the stove. I remember sleeping on the pastry section. Well, that's what in, in the restaurant. That's, that's yeah. what did happen. Next, place a spoonful of the pheasant stuffing between two of the pasta discs, and pinch them together to form your ravioli. So, what's the best Christmas present you've ever had then? Well, it's my first Christmas present. I will always remember. Yeah. It was. Wrap into a little lichen fall of a tablet of chocolate. It was an orange, the first orange I ever had in my life. I was about five or six years old. And that is fantastic Christmas present. I was smelling my orange. Nobody would have taken my orange away. And uh, when my mom said, you can open it up, I didn't know what to do with it. I don't know how to open it. You know, that's something. It, it shows how special Christmas should be, though, shouldn't it, really? Well, Rather than yeah. it, but, but, but they've been commercialised and everything else. But well, you saying that, you, you know, it just... You, you can't stop the progress and how the world is moving. But there was something. Next, chop a bunch of kale and put some butter in a pan with a little water and garlic. Then sauté the kale till it's softened. It's not bad having this commie chef in the kitchen, to be no, honest. No, 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 but it's lovely. <laughs> I knew you. I was not only invited for a drink. Well, precisely, yeah. You've <laughs> got to always something. You've got to work for yourself. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. I well, normally you. we're on the golf course, aren't we? Really, more than anything else. Yes. Yeah. You want mm. to wear that shirt actually on the golf course? Uh, we'll see you in the woods. No, yeah, but the pheasant will see me. <laughs> now fry some wild mushrooms in a pan with some butter and add a chopped shallot. Next, take the pheasant out of the oven and check to see if it's ready. And we're in business. So we're nearly there. <coughs> well, you know this is the whole story. Two chefs together. Eh? Almost finished. Almost finished. Right. Yeah. There's your... Oh, lovely. 
think that's probably probably one. Uh, uh, a little bit longer. Dutch Honda, you, you need another two or three minutes. It's me uh, panicking, that's what it is. Uh, uh, <coughs> we've got, uh, it's only Christmas once a year, so don't panic, OK? I'm not panicking. It's just, just <laughs> happened to have a three standish and chef in my kitchen. I'm not, oh, I'm not panicking at all. It's, okay, it's just okay. normal Christmas, isn't it, for everybody? Did you pepper the mushroom? I think I did, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me check. <laughs> no, you did not. No, I, did. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to forget something. I need a drink. <laughs> Come here, okay. drink. When the pheasant is ready, Set the breast crown to one side. Add a splash of Madeira and some hot reduced stock to the pan and bring it to the boil. Mm. Very good. What does it need? Mm. Oh, no, it's perfect. No. Now strain the sauce. Add a little more shaved truffle and pop your ravioli in a pan of boiling water. This will only take three minutes to cook, so we can carve the pheasant and plate up. First with the kale and mushrooms and then the pheasant breast. Lovely. Oh, 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 oh. Oh. Oh, give me that. Uh, please, can I have it? Uh, <laughs> oh, la, 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 la. And now the pasta is ready, we can pour over our lovely jus. Tell you what, Michelle, that's not bad, is it? Looks bloody good. <laughs> <laughs> Seal the deal with a final flourish of truffle shavings. Well, it is Christmas after all. You can yeah. tell you're not paying for this one, can't you? Look at that. Uh, that's it. <laughs> Whoa. I tell you what, that looks pretty good, doesn't it? This is, to me, a classic sort of dish around Christmas time. Perfect dish. Mm. And the texture is perfect. Lovely pheasant. So full of flavour, though. I don't know why, why us Brits don't eat more of pheasant. It's um, beautiful. And it took 15, 20 minutes to cook. The stuffing's not bad for the ravioli as well. Oh, stop there, stop there. <laughs> a little come bit more. Come, no, come, come, come again. <laughs> Look at that. Isn't this lovely? You're quite right. I'm quite pleased with my stuff here. Yeah, yeah it's mm. not, you're not bad at this. You should yeah. try it for a living, maybe sometime. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, it just isn't Christmas without these classic dishes and ingredients. And if you serve them with good company and a glass of whatever takes your fancy, it's sure to be a merry one. Cheers. Happy Christmas, boss. I'll see you in the golf course next time. Oh, no. I prefer right. to cook with you than play golf. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Christmas, boss. Happy Christmas. It's delicious, that. Lovely.